Welcome to Bar Chart's series of educational webinars designed to enlighten you on a variety of trading ideas and concepts, inform you of the pages and tools Bar Chart provides related to these concepts, as well as offering you some trader's insight to help you make a more informed investment decision. Today's session, Charting 2024, Navigating Market Uncertainty. Now, as we enter the start of the new year, with the major indices at or near all-time highs, why headline risk of threat of recession or specter of persistent inflation, with a myriad of market catalysts from the presidential cycle to Fed policy, geopolitical events, unemployment, consumer spending, and the Treasury's escalating debt insurance will only help to cloud investors assessment of the investment horizon hello everyone my name is john roland bar chart senior market analyst and today i want to help you cut through the veil of market uncertainty using an ins insightful uh, market data analysis that ceos trust and rely on to make their business decisions now, although much of the data that we're going to look at takes experience to interpret, I believe that markets does the work for us. In other words, it relays this data information back to us in the form of price, the price of goods and services, the price of commodities, and ultimately the price of the companies that are directly impacted or related to these economic data points so reading reading uh the price in some selective uh, few charts could give us an insight to where we've been but more importantly where we're heading now however this type of analysis is not a tick for tick or conducive for short-term trading, but it can offer a better big picture perspective that ultimately influences lower time frame analysis and can give traders and investors a higher probability of results. Now, before we get to that, please welcome our moderator and Bar Charts Project Director, Jean Baker. Hello, Jean, and Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year, John. This is uh, nice to start 2024 off on a on a good webinar topic. And you know, by the way, I went back and I looked. John has conducted 37 webinars back in the previous year for our bar chart community. Um, so congratulations, John. Congrats oh, on a great you. 2023, and let's look forward to a great 2024. I'm definitely looking forward to uh, a productive and meaningful 2024. But it is amazing that uh, if you think about it, um, in terms of how many we did create last year. So that's a cool stat for me to remember. Thanks, Gene, appreciate that. Are you ready to get started then? Absolutely. All right. So remember that today's session is for educational purposes only and that decisions to buy, sell, or hold or trade in securities, commodities, or other investments is best made on the advice of a qualified financial professional. And under no circumstances shall we be liable for any losses or damages that you or anyone incurs as a result of trading or trading activity based on an information that you receive through our chart.com and our services. Now, I will add to this that this process that I'm gonna show you today is of my design. And I'm not advocating that this is a right methodology or that it's without fault, but rather if you believe that the market is always looking forward and it is discounting information, public and private, then prices of equities, commodities, and financial rates are a reflection of these critical data points. Now, today is not a market prediction show. That's not what we're trying to achieve here today. Rather, it's more of a presentation of how to turn the intricate into the simple. All right. 
So where do we get these these concepts or ideas about um, market data? So first, we're going to go to Conference Board. And Conference Board publishes leading uh, coincident and lagging uh, indexes designed to help signal peaks or troughs in business cycles, not market cycles, business cycles for economies around the world. And uh, our focus today, we're going to look at uh, leading economic indicators and coincidence indicators, and we're going to concentrate on just U.S. data. Now, there are 10 leading economic indicators, three financials and seven non-financials. Now, some of these data points are in the public domain and others are proprietary. Now, what I'm going to do is demonstrate how bar chart subscribers can use the information found on our website to perform a similar analysis as of these uh, indicators. So let's start with the financial components. And the easiest and the most obvious one here you can see for a leading indica indicator is the S&P or stock prices. So if you go to bar chart, uh, this is go up here to bar chart. Under uh, stocks, you can go where it says market indexes. And in here, you're going to find a plethora of indexes, some of them are macro and some of them granular, but also a variety of other indexes that you can use for your analysis. So let's talk about the S&P for a moment here. So you can see that since uh, October of 2022, and that we're in this uptrend, and you can see an acceleration of this trend since October of 2023. Now, this is a positive outlook for uh, the market. In other words, you know, leading economic indicator. Now, the narrative data that we've been hearing is that the Fed has come to an end of a rate height cycle and the market is pricing in potential rate cuts. Now, since the market is always looking forward, now most folks believe that it's somewhere between six to 18 months. If we think about this last cycle up or this last acceleration of price around October 23rd, then when the market is now pricing in, you know, rate cuts somewhere around March, or May of next year, that's six to eight months or so in front. But that's where we've come from, but where do we go from here? So I think there's two paths that we can start looking for based on the economic data that we're going to go through. First is, do we see an expansion of earnings growth or in the business cycle, will we find headwinds? Now, some of those headwinds could be slowing growth, inflation, financial and fiscal uh, policy, you know, the government raising debt and the treasury crowding out the private sector by uh, um, uh, raising the, or doing the issuance. And so um, what I've done is I've created a watch list of 10 plus stocks or symbols that you can use in this analysis of this uh, these economic data points. Now, the one that I've added here, here below the S&P is also Apple. Now, as far as Apple goes, right, the theory is that as Apple goes, so does the market. Remember, Apple is the most widely held stock. And so there is this kind of belief that as where what Apple does will kind of reflect of what the market is, does. Now, we just saw the S&P looks like it's in a nice uptrend, uh, but we can see Apple here has now stalled a bit. And what could be, not predicting this, but could be a potential double top. So let's go back to our leading economic indicators. So we have uh, interest rate spreads. And here it tells us we're looking at the 10-year bond less the Fed funds rate. Now, the path of discovery 
um, in terms of some of the data points we're going to look at. It's going to diverge a little bit here, at least in terms of the source of information. Now, there's many of these trading point uh, data points that we're going to look at here um, in our session today, um, especially those are the ones that the Fed uses, can be found on a website called the FRED. Uh, FRED stands for the Federal Reserve's Economic Data. So again, all you need to do on the FRED here is come in and type in whatever you're looking for. And it will search that for you. And you can see here, a little bit down here, here is the 10-year treasury minus the three month. And that is what um, we are looking for, what we want to look for is one of these in leading indica indicators. And this is commonly called the yield curve. Now you can see that it is inverted. What does that mean? Well, that means that short-term rates are higher than long-term rates. And this has been inverted for quite some time. Now, uh, a in yield curve that is inverted is not very healthy for the business cycle. It drains liquidity and it tightens credit costs. Now notice though, if we look at history here, that these gray bars here represent um, a recession. And that after returning to normal, a normal yield curve, uh, we see longer rates higher than short-term rates, that we do see or we do get a, a, a recession. Now, some economists will say that that coming of the recession is because of slower growth and unemployment, and that is what sparks the Fed to cut rates. Let's go back to bar chart. I go back to stocks here and under stocks under economic overview, we can click on that and that will take you to, you can find a lot of these uh, yields or these, a, a lot of different economic data points in terms of like mortgage rates and stuff. Um, so let's go to the 10 year note. And I'm gonna go to a chart here. And what we can see that from you know August of 21 to current that we're seeing that the 10 year note rate has been rising. Uh, that is usually a sign of you know potentially of a steepening yield curve, but we did see that because the short term rates have been going higher. Now, my question would be here is this rally that we've seen in rates last year, is this or a sell off in treasury? no prices, is this the bond market's attempt to price in this normalization of short-term rates to long-term rates? So if I go into here where it says FX and I go into create an expression, now we don't have the 10 and the three month, but we have something called the tens and the twos. And again, this is a good substitute for one of those economic indicators very similar to the 10 and the three month. And so you can see that we are recently have bottomed and now the yield curve is starting uh, to steepen. So what I've done here is, uh, is I've gone into a comparison here and I've added the S&P uh, index as a comparison. And that is this purple line. So again, if I look at history on this, what we do see is that typically that the market will rise as the inverted yield curve bottoms. But that some point after that, especially as we get closer to, let's say, a normalization, a zero inverted uh, yield curve, that the market has a some type of a correction. And I don't want to just say the R word, I'm just saying a market correction. Now, historically, when we go back in time and we look at these events, that it usually is about 12 to 18 months in the future 
from when the yield curve bottoms. And if we look at where the yield curve bottomed recently, that was somewhere around you know the end of June, early July. So that in history would predict that the, we should see some type of a market correction or a potential recession somewhere between 12 and 18 months. And that would put us in you know the second to third quarter of 2024. But I want you to think about why would the Fed cut rates? Think about the Fed's uh, mandate, right? Their mandate is to fight inflation and to support unemployment, or excuse me, support employment. So currently, as we look at other leading economic indicators, I want you to think about what might be the impetus for uh, um, some rate cuts. All right, so, um, the other financial component is called the leading credit index. Now, this is a proprietary uh, index to the conference board, but the Fed or Fred does offer something that is quite similar to that. Let me pull that up. And that is called the Chicago Fed's um, Financial Conditions Index. And let me put this to more current data. How you read this one is that positive values represent financial conditionings are tightening and negative values indicate financial conditionings are loosening. You can see that we are still in negative. And matter of fact, since about March of this last year, uh, financial conditions have been loosening. So from this point here, you know, again, if we go back in history here, we can see that during times of uh, tightening, we do tend to see more corrections or potential recessions. But let's just kind of move forward from here. So we do see the market has been in a loosening financial condition, which is kind of different from the narrative if you would hear you know um you know on some of the, your uh tv pundit uh, talking head shows so since march all right so let's go back to our watch list and the next one that i have on the watch list is the home builders etf now think about this who would benefit the most you would think from a loosening financial conditions, home builders, right? Folks can have the opportunity or a lot easier for them to uh, buy or build homes. So I think uh, if we look at this one in terms of the chart, why I like this as uh, a, a good indicator, let me go to a weekly chart just because we're looking at much higher timeframes. Remember what I said, that somewhere around March, we saw a loosening of financial conditions. So here we are around March for the uh, home builders. And uh, again, notice that that loosening created an uptrend in home builders. Now let's go back to this, um, right? Notice that here we see a little bit of an uptick, right? A change or maybe potential start of some tightening. This started back around, you know, late August, and then, you know, then it rolled back over in around October. Again, let's go back to our home builders, right? It rallied all the way up until about late August, and uh, it fell until, you know, uh, late uh, October. Again, so a bit of a, a good indication of a, economic indicator how it plays out in terms of price let's go back to our indicators so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at our non-financial components and i want to look at these kind of as a whole um, we're going to combine some of these together but i'll look at them in two different groups and one would be those that are uh, reflective of the consumer and the other one would be reflective of um, companies. Now, before I move forward from here, I also want to um, introduce a second set of indicators. So 
attached to today's session, right, are some slides, and you can find them on our webpage and on the archives. You will see a little uh, PDF attachment, and you will find these slides. Well, a lot of these economic indicators that I'm talking about is here are some hyperlinks for you on the thread where you can find those uh, the, the that information. For instance, uh, here we see um, new permits for like, housing permits. Again, if I go back to you know our indicator here is building permits. Here's one that says average consumer expectations for business business conditions. Well, that would be a good substitute for that would be the Michigan Consumer Sediment Index. So they're all here. Here's the 10 and the threes. Um, here's your financial conditions, uh, unemployment. But the other set of uh, indicators that I want to add to are these coincident ones. And these are really what at the moment, the now indicators. And so you can see some of them are retail sales. Here's our non-farm payrolls. Uh, here's a personal income, right? Real personal income, or referred to as the PCE. And if you follow the Fed, they tell you that this is the one major data point that they're looking at. Um, and then, you know, we can look at something like industrial production to mimic, you know, our companies in terms of our new orders, IMS new orders, our manufacturer orders, consumer good, good orders. All right, so let's go back to our watch list. So the next one here is the dollar index. And I think the dollar index, in terms of what I wanna get out of these leaning in, in indicators is that I think the dollar index is a good substitute now it's an inverse, but it's a good substitute for new orders. Now, why do I say that? Well, let's go to uh, the dollar index. And what I've done here, just to just clarify what, what you're looking at is I have added Bollinger Bands, just to kind of give you a bit, let you visualize this range that we've seen that the dollar index has a bid in <clears throat> so you can see that you know we've you know the dollar index has been kind of in this range since about november of 2022 but let's again let's go back to our comparison and again i've already uh, added this in and one of the features that we have on uh, our charts is you can turn off a comparison or a, a study for the time being until you need it. And so here I've already got it loaded up. Just need to click on this little eye here and it'll turn that on. And so what we can see here is that the dollar index <clears throat> can be a headwind or a tailwind for the greater market. And you can see here as the dollar strengthened uh, you know, equities fell as the dollar weakened, equities rose. As the dollar strengthened, equities fell. As the dollar weakened, equities rose. Now, why would that happen? Well, you know, a lot of our large cap, mega cap uh, uh, companies uh, drive a lot of revenue um, offshore from foreign customers. So as the dollar gets stronger, that makes their goods or services more expensive and that could affect their revenue um, and vice versa. As the dollar becomes weaker, that makes U.S. goods cheaper and that might be uh, uh, beneficial to a lot of these mega um, cap companies. Now, we think about the dollar index too. We can also think about uh, commodities and one of the pure commodity plays that we can talk about is gold. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna add gold. And for those you who are not familiar with futures symbols, if you just put the root symbol of your futures contract star zero, which is gonna give you is um, a chart that will look at the continuous price of gold. So um, again, this, as the 
dollar gets stronger, commodity prices tend to fall. As the dollar gets weaker, commodity prices tend to rise. And that could be beneficial as well for uh, beneficials or headwinds or tailwinds for uh, uh, companies. So if I said to you folks, um, if we thought about gold, if I asked you to think about gold and its relationship to equities, I think a lot of you would say that there has an inverse um, relationship, that whole safe haven or that hedge against inflation. But here is our gold chart. And the blue line represents the S&P. And notice that what we really do see is that there is a greater positive relationship than there is an inverse relationship. And when we do see them diverge from each other, as we see here, as we see here, and as we see here, that is typically a buying opportunity for gold. We're not seeing that currently, right? They're both rallying. So gold bugs out there, you know, believe it or not, one of the two scenarios you should be looking for is rising equity prices. Now, the other would be, of course, our falling dollar index. And so the market, I think, is really at a crossroads here in terms of our equities have been stalling. We saw Apple, we saw the S&P, right? Near all-time highs, but stalling. And our dollar is kind of stuck in the range. And where are we in that range? We're at the lower end of the range and we've just bounced off of our Bollinger Band. So there's a higher probability that we might revert back uh, to the mean. Now, why would the dollar go up? Well, that would be maybe because the Fed doesn't cut rates and makes U.S. Treasuries more attractive because they have a higher uh, interest rate value. Now, if we're talking about commodities or a pure play commodities, you know, I use gold as an example, but some of you might be familiar with the the discussion of something called Dr. Copper, that copper can be a good uh, commodity to look at that is um, sensitive to economic activity. Now, I'm not disputing this. Matter of fact, I do subscribe to this. But I also think that you know aluminum is also another great commodity to look for um, this economic sensitivity. And so that's why I've added Alcoa here. Now, if I pull up the Alcoa chart, again, if you don't know who Alcoa is, they're one of the world's largest global um, aluminum producers. What we're noticing recently is, well, historically here, we do see that there is this kind of correlation, again, not tick for tick, but there's this correlation between the S&P and what is going on with um, uh, oh, and again, what we're trying to do is find a substitute for some of these leading economic indicators, our ISM uh, new orders. So what could be Alcoa telling us here? Because we do see a divergence currently, right? The market is going up, but Alcoa stock price is going down. So could this be an indication that we're seeing falling new orders? Well, new orders are actually are falling. Um, and then think about your current big ticket purchase, something that you've just bought, let's say in the last six months or so, or maybe just anything that's in your house that you touched in the last couple of days. Is there more aluminum in it or more copper in it? And is Alcoa here a warning sign for us, right? a leading economic indicator, or do we need to see material stocks like Alcoa improve a part of an improving business cycle? 
So that is something that we need to watch, I think, over the next, uh, you know, three to six months in terms of market and business cycle. So let's go back to our non-financials. And so we're, we, I showed you kind of a way how you can do, you know, the ISMs in your manufacturer new orders using the dollar index, using commodities, and um, looking at some very specific uh, stocks that are very commodity sensitive. And again, if you feel copper is your thing and you want to look at you know, some copper producers, I have no problem using that tool as well. So let's talk about uh, the consumer here now. So again, our um, consumer expectations, our hourly um, work hours, and um, our average uh, unemployment claims. So for those next ones, I'm going to, on my watch list, are going to be these four. Uh, the IWM, uh, the XRT, PKG, and uh, heating oil. So let's think about this. We'll go back. These are related to goods produced, right? Our ISM orders, right? They're all going to relate to that. But forward looking in terms of our hourly, weekly hours and in our employment, uh, they're also going to have uh, an impact on those particular symbols. So the theory basically here is that, you know, the more hours uh, someone works or an employee works, the more money that they're going to have. Now, if you have more unemployment, obviously, then you have, you know, less money for the consumer uh, has. So if we think about the IWM, right, the IWM represents small cap companies. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but 60% of all the jobs in the United States are in small cap companies. And in an uptick in business cycles, 80% um, of new jobs come from small caps. Now, the narrative you're going to hear, and you've probably been hearing it already, is that we're looking for this broader market participation. And there's a lot of folks that are out there are talking about that the IWM is going to outperform this year. Now, why would that be? Well, what are they thinking about? Well, they're thinking that there's going to be this growth spurt or this expansion in earnings. And these companies are going to hire more people and more people are going to have money in their pockets and that would induce consumer spending right more workers more money in their pockets more spending so if you look at the chart of iwm and these lines here represent moving averages uh the 2050 100 and 200 days so they're all currently are all trending higher, that's a good sign. Uh, the IDM, IWM has broken out of a range that it has been, had been in for quite a period of time, but has now recently fallen back into that range. Now that is not necessarily a bad thing, but it is definitely a cautionary tale that we need to keep an eye on over the next, oh, let's say three to six months. But we would really like to see this as it leading economic indicator is that the IWM gets back out of this range and then starts moving above some of these more recent highs. So that takes us to the next one in our watch list, which is our retail spider. Now, why I like this one over some of the other retail ETFs is first of all um if we go into the constituents here on this one you know dare i say you know these are you know brick and mortar type companies or you know the the old school re, uh retail right um and the other reason why i like this uh etf as a tool is when we look at the the holding percentage holdings this is a relatively equal weighted um uh, e ETF. 
And so that companies, for instance, like, um, where are we at? Yeah, Amazon, right? Uh, Target and Walmart, which in other retail ETFs might have a higher weighting, right? Where they might distort price. So here we're seeing that all these companies kind of have um, uh, equal weighting. So, you know, a healthy consumer spends money across a wide range of consumer goods. And here we see a wide range of consumer goods. Now, if I go to the chart, again, um, you know, similar to what we saw with the IWM, we were, we're kind of range bound here, right? Now, currently the trend is up, which is a positive sign and a positive leading economic indicator in my world. But what I would like to see here in terms of a leading economic indicator is that it breaks out of this range and then, you know, goes about trying to challenge, you know, its all time highs. Now, apart from that, um, that would mean that we might get a drawback and a drawback might indicate to me as an indication that we have a weak consumer. Now, let's think about your own personal consumption. And, you know, I believe in that you don't need to know what's going around the world. You don't need to know what's going around all over the United States. All you need to do is observe and look at what's happening in your own backyard. Just observe what is happening to me. Now, if I'm buying, well, if my wife is buying, and again, this is not, I'm not, this is not a sexist, uh, term me, I'm just this is the reality in my household. But if she's buying stuff, you know, when it comes to um, uh, you know taking out my recyclables on you know uh, once a month, you know my cardboard recyclables are always full. So let's go back to our watch list, and that would take us to um, Packaging Corporation of America. And if we look at the business summary here, we can see that they are the third largest cardboard manufacturer in the United States. Now, some of you would say, well, John, why are you looking at the third largest? Why wouldn't you look at the largest one, for instance, like West Rock? Well, you know, the largest uh, producer might have a competitive advantage, might have a mon monopolistic advantage over some of these lessers. And my thought process is if number three is prospering, then everybody's prospering. So if we go to the chart on that, again, if I look at the S&P as a comparison, it's not a tick for tick, but you can see that there is a positive correlation that as this company does well, so does um, uh, the index, or so does the market. But I also want you to take a moment here when you get a chance is look at in the history of this one that many times a peak in price of this stock also forewarns of a peak in the broader market. But right now, currently both of them are you know near all-time highs in, and continuing to trend further and they're tandeming together. So that is a good economic indication as far as my book is concerned. So the final one that is on my watch list is uh, heated oil or another commodity. Now in Charles Dow, uh, Charles Dow of the Dow Index, and there's something called Dow Theory. And that, what Dow said basically was that, you know, in his time, he had two indexes. He had the Dow Industrials and the Dow Transportation. And he said in terms of understanding primary trends or big picture trends, that you need to see both the indexes doing the same thing. In other words, if they're both making new all-time highs, that would be a confirmation that you have a strong uh, uptrend. And that was based on the principle that you have goods produced, but you still need to deliver those goods. So what is uh, ULSD? Well, it's ultra low sulfur diesel. Diesel, right? The fuel that runs trucks, trains, ships that are used to deliver goods 
from our base commodities, for instance, like aluminum, to finished consumer goods, like GI Joe with the Kung Fu grip. <laughs> That's from a line, um, uh, one of my favorite movies, uh, Trading Places. If you haven't seen that movie, it's a great, it's a great market movie. Now, again, this is not a tick for tick analysis here, but what are we seeing currently in terms of heating oil versus one of our other leading economic indicators, stock prices, we're seeing a divergence. Now, is heating oil foretelling an economic slowdown, or do we need to see, as we see here or in other times, do we need to see heating oil prices rise as a reflection of a rise in fuel demands, economic activity? Now, yes, low fuel costs can be a tailwind for uh, the market, and high fuel costs can be a headwind. But the oil market does a very good job of balancing supply and demand. And what the market is telling us, the heating oil market is telling us right now, is that there's too much supply because there's not enough demand. So again, I think there's this is a very key economic indicator for us to look for over the next three to six months. What I would really like to see is heating oil prices go up as demand for heating oil increases in other words as more and more goods and services being um, delivered a flat falling diesel market might send to me an indication that we are seeing economic growth slow and that could be uh, systemic for uh yeah. okay so where are we at we're right on time perfect Let's go back to our watch list. So what we've basically done here in these 10 symbols, or actually there's 11 here, is we've turned all of these economic indicators, our leading and also our coincident, coincident uh, economic indicators into a symbol. One of the symbols that we can find on our chart and bar chart and ones that we can watch, not necessarily trade, not necessarily invested, but to derive that information based on price. Okay, so let's do this second, Gene, is um, look at some of the questions that um, are in uh, our question box. And while John does that, let me just tell everybody that in the start of a brand new year here, uh, Bar Chart has a number of different uh, membership options for you if you are not already a member. We have a free membership tool where you have some basic access to a lot of the information on our website. We also offer two uh, packages, one called Bar Chart Plus, one is Bar Chart Premium, that will allow you to do a lot of the charting analysis that John was just uh, was showing you on the website. So if you haven't tried either Plus or Premier, you can certainly sign up for a free 30-day trial today and get access to uh, a lot of the site features. And if membership is not your thing, uh, we, we still encourage you to sign up at least for a free membership so that you can unlock a lot of the other different tools on the site. So back to you, John. Thanks, Gene. Yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, point. If you haven't had a chance to try out some of our premier features, plus features, it's definitely a, a no-brainer in terms of giving yourself a head start in this new year. Um, you know, what's the risk? 30-day trial, there is no risk. Um, so I, I'm going through a lot of your questions here. I've seen that I think I've answered um, pretty much most of them. Um, there is one question here that says that the dollar index is dependent on, isn't the dollar index dependent on interest rates? Yes, that's again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find those substitutes of symbols that are on our website that would be reflective of what we see on those leading, indica uh, um, leading economic 
indicator. So that would be a yes to that. All right. Okay, so let's do this. So again, here's that list as a watch list to, um, that I have in your sl my slides. And let's get to takeaways. So now these are my own uh, ideas, right? These, these are not predictions. I'm just telling you what I'm watching for. So I wanna talk about some of the things that I'm uh, watching for this year. So what I'm thinking about is where's my watch list okay will the market be disappointed with the timing and frequency of rate cuts in other words is the fed going to be longer and um you know higher before longer so i think in that sense we would want to be watching you know our 10-year note but not necessarily our 10-year note, but keep an eye on that yield curve. Will revenue growth go across a larger breadth of sectors and indices that will carry the market to new heights? Well, that would be a great tool for that one would be our IWM. Or will fiscal policy, government spending, increase the ever-growing debt, which means then, then Treasury has to have more uh, issuances, right? And that will crowd out public, excuse me, private or corporate funding, tightening, right? Again, watching the yield curve, tightening credit and raising um, the cost of credit. Now, at some point, we do need to see a normalization of the yield curve. And do we think that that is going to happen with yields all falling on the front end because of the Fed's mandate, right? This um, trying to control inflation, or will we start seeing a rise in unemployment? And will that affect, um, you know, the markets? So if I think about that in terms of unemployment or economic cycle will there be evidence of a strong business cycle be reflected in the price of commodities diesel uh, aluminum copper and or will a healthy consumer more jobs more money be reflective in retail sales, in consumer goods. And could we use our cardboard company as a tool to help us decipher retail sales? And also, don't forget about our RT. All right, so one final thought here, Gene, before we end today's session. don't need to be an economist to digest uh, all of this complex data. You know, as long as you believe in the efficiency and the discounting aspect of the market, the market will read and react to the data. All we need to do is listen to what the market price is telling us. All right, Gene, I think that was a good session. Oh, do you, did you like that? I sure did. I hope everybody else out there found uh, some helpful little tidbits along the way as well. Uh, well one last question here, Mark asks, is do a, a, does a use a three-year chart as the best to use? Again, Mark, in the beginning, we talked about how this is more of a big picture. So yes, I like looking at a three-year chart because it's a weekly chart, and so it's more of a big picture. Could I look at, a, let's say, a monthly, some monthly charts, like a five-year or a 10-year? Again, big picture, that would be fine as well. All right. So next week, let's see what we have on the calendar. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a, another session that is maybe not necessarily about bar chart itself, but more about uh, how to be a better trader, how to be uh, 
you know, some of the skills that we need to have as we move into this new year. So we're going to talk about some common sense approach to successful risk management. Uh, I'm going to give you some nine basic rules. And then also we're going to talk about um, some uh, protective stops and that methodology um, that we could apply to just some simple trading plan rules that will help achieve you know, some greater profitability as long as you know, we're picking right trades, you know, if we use the right combination of stops and methodology, you know, we don't have to be right every time. Matter of fact, we can actually be wrong more times than we're right and still be a profitable trader. So that's important for us, uh, a lesson I think we'll need to work on. Okay. John, one right. last thing, if I can. I've had a number of people ask if there's going to be a replay. So go ahead and click on that archive webinars, right? And give us a couple hours. Uh, the recording is not there yet, but it's down, uh, John's showing where you can download the slides for today's session. And a link to the recording will also be there in a couple hours. Uh, you will also be able to find that on our Chard's YouTube channel, uh, which there's a little red YouTube button up at the top. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel and get notifications. So. Um, give us a couple hours. It'll be out there. Yeah, and if you watch it on, if you're watching now on YouTube, give us a thumbs up or drop a comment in there. We really would appreciate that. That helps um, with our uh, data processing or whatever they call the algorithm that helps track. So I appreciate that if you do that. Okay, folks. Uh, until next time, uh, be safe out there. The best of health and the good of all trading.